you know, to sit with them or to talk about some of their feelings or to see what the, why they're upset or why they're angry. Uh, if we just put them away, we don't deal with the causes of what's going on. And, and there are reasons why children behave in the way they do. And it's important to find out and find out what's going on and try to help that child deal with the emotions. It's much more effective than simply putting them in a timeout. Sometimes we do need timeouts, but we have to recognize that often timeouts are for us, not for the kids. And sometimes we need them, and sometimes they say, I can't deal with this right now. But recognize it for us, not for, for them. And uh, important how important it is for uh, us to deal with children who are having problems one way or another, because uh, they're upset for a reason. And if we know those reasons, we can help prevent that happening from again. But if we don't know, we're not really helping the situation. Any. All we're teaching the child is that feelings are not worth anything, or feelings are not worth anything. So time ends are as important as time outs. The last uh, thing I'll, I'll talk about is quality time, because again, another kind of thing we've sort of come up with now to deal with all the pre all the pressures we have, and less time we have with kids, and so on. Is this idea that somehow if we we can substitute quality time for quantity time? To tell you the truth, I don't know what quality time means. Um, and again, if I use a personal example. Um, my parents were working class, my father was a machinist, we had six children in the family. Uh, we lived in a three-bedroom apartment, and, and uh, you know, and, and I was up to, I was the youngest, I slept on a pillow in the living room. And we, we, we only had a little tiny kitchen, and only to see two people, so we ate in shifts. And my mother had to cook all this time, and, cook. and we, had, we had a dining room, a little tiny dining room. We never ate in a dining room. I don't know why. We never, all the, all the that was reserved for holidays. I don't know why. <laughs> we could have eaten there. <laughs> never, anyway. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we did, you know, everybody has their things. Um, uh, <clears throat> in any case, my father worked in, 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 in uh, Detroit, worked in a machine shop in uh, the auto industry. And, you know, he worked long hours. He worked 10 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. I rarely saw my father. I didn't play tennis with him. Fishing with him, I didn't go to baseball games with him. So when he would day home, he was tired, and uh, uh, so occasionally when we had, you know, he had a little time to teach me to use tools around the house and so on. Um, but he, you know, he, there was no, I never had any quality, nor much less with my mother was very, you know, kids, kids, a family trying to, you know, there wasn't a lot of time. Uh, but um, my brothers and sisters and I. Love my father and my mother dearly, respected them greatly, um, because uh, what they did was a sacrifice. I mean, my father had his own intellectual interests, his own things, but he he uh, did those so we could have a better life. And he never bought anything for himself. He never, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, everything was for the kids, and he never spent anything on himself. And he never did it with the thought somehow that we had to owe him something or return it or something. And the thought never been in his eyes. Or a deeply religious man, honest man, thought never entered his mind. We were, this was his responsibility. He'd taken on, and we all appreciated that way when my mother did. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't think it has to do with so much with time and quality time. It has to do with, with something which we don't hear a lot about today, but, but I think is sacrifice. As parents, so we have to sacrifice. And that's, it is a sacrifice having children, but sometimes we forget, uh, and um, we, we begin to, um, and it's too easy to sort of buy things, kids, and give things, kids, and, and feeling that we're sacrificing, or we've spent a long time working, and so on. But often it's because we want to work, or because we want something, rather than because we want it for the kids. And so we have to be honest with ourselves. Uh, that doesn't mean we can sacrifice the way my father did, but there are a lot of things that we can do uh, that make a kid special. For example, we have several children take one child at a time on a trip or shopping or something to make each child special. To think about that child in ten, you know, as an individual. What is he or she really like? And to buy a gift, I mean, that's an expensive gift, but really reflects that child's interest and concerns and so on. All those things are little writing notes or when we're away or all of those things. And doing something, sometimes things for the kids which they can do for themselves. The kids are always making their breakfast for the way. Make breakfast for them one day. So it, it, it's, you know, it, it's a little things, but uh, it's so important that kids feel that we, you know, the so most important thing we can give children really is a sense that they're important in our lives and we care about them deeply. They're important in our lives. If a child has that, and that's what our parents gave us, and my parents, you know, 
that's the most important thing you can do. If a kid feels wanted, feels important in somebody's life, and you know that somebody cares about him deeply, however that's conveyed, doesn't have to be conveyed by playing baseball or by you know going to dances together, whatever. It has to be conveyed by by showing in whatever way you can that, that you know that we're willing to sacrifice for them. That's why saying no is so important to kids because when you say no to an adolescent, when we set limits, we're saying we care enough to say no. We care enough to deal with the confrontation. We care enough to be with the fact that you're not going to like this and you're going to argue with us and so on. We care enough for that. This is some teenagers tell me, you know, well, about a kid who had e easy access to his parents' liquor cabinet. They must not love that kid or they, they wouldn't let him do that with it. So when we set limits, when we say no, when we, that's one way that we sacrifice and kids know that. Well, um, so I, I think that we just have to rethink some of these things. It's easy now in our postmodern lives and busy lives to forget some basic essentials about children and what children need. Um, well, I, I do a lot of television. I was getting on a plane recently, Logan, and so I walked down the aisle, a gentleman caught me by the sleeve and said, you, 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 he said, you, 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 I've seen you on television. Uh, you, 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 you're somebody, he said. <laughs> And that made me feel good. <laughs> but it also made me reflect that we all need to feel for somebody, and that's certainly true for children and adolescents. And we wait to take the time and make the sacrifices to give them you know, the feeling that they're really important in their lives, that we care about them deeply. We give them all these wonderful, good experiences that help them deal with whatever bad experiences they may have later. Thank you all. So I'll be happy to take the second. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, in our community, there's a big push right now for all day kindergarten and for moving the sixth graders to the middle school. What can we as, do as parents to help get the administration and the school board to see that there shouldn't be a big rush for these kids? Yeah, the full day kindergarten is a, a, a an issue all over the country. I think the most important thing to is that full day kindergarten is a child care issue. It's not an educational issue. And if we keep that in mind, then we say, okay, parents need good quality child care. It's not available, it's not affordable for so many parents. Schools are, are trustworthy, they're safe for places, teachers are certified. If you have a good quality program, so that a usual kindergarten program in the morning, and quiet activities in the afternoon for children to nap, to listen to records, to read a story, then it, it can do no harm. It really can be helpful to a lot of parents because uh, um, so if we think about it in that way, I think the problem is too many administrators say, well, we have to get, you know, full day kindergarten, we have to have full day education and programs, so, and that's where the mistake is. But if we recognize that it's a child care initiative, that children, five-year-old children, really can't deal with a full day of, of academic kind of stuff, but they can certainly deal with afternoon squad activities in the afternoon, naps and so on, and if you run your full day kindergarten that way, there's really not a problem. Uh, at the same time, there are many parents who don't want their children in school full day, and, and yet they feel, you know, that if they do put, if they don't put their children, their children will lose something. That's not true. But I, I think that the real problem with the full day kindergarten is not the, uh, is that it's, it's not really a full day kindergarten. It's a half day kindergarten and half day child care, which is the way it should be placed. And then that, that's that's I think uh, if it were des described in that way, I think it would be. So I have no objection to it as long as it's good quality. You know, childcare in the afternoon, and I mean, you can't clearly distinguish between childcare and education, but, but that's really the problem. It's a, it's a, it's a childcare issue, not an educational issue, and we have to make that, realize that, and make that point clear to the administrators. As far as middle school, um, it's, it can work, uh, the, the five, six, six, seven, eight kind of, as opposed to, but, um, the biggest problem with is the first year. Because those that first year, these kids who have been in fifth grade and going into sixth, they've all now they look forward to being the oldest, and they never get to be the oldest because now they're the youngest again. So it's that transition year into the middle school, which is the worst time. Um, but uh, one can make a case, uh, particularly today with all that goes on in high schools, that maybe uh, keeping kids in middle school and you know um, earlier and so on, and, and the way that. 
the addressing kids and so on. <laughs> so there are a lot of, but I think ma major, I don't see any real uh, problem with the six, seven, eight, um, so long as it, the real is the transition problem. But um, we, uh, and if it's a real middle, the problem with, with middle schools, they're not really middle schools. They're really junior high schools called middle schools. They're really good middle schools. There's a whole middle school philosophy which has team teaching, long periods. If it's a true middle school, then it's great. But I find many places change the ages, but they don't put it in a middle school, and then it's really a mistake. I mean, if you just have to do your junior high school thing, then I think you shouldn't go that way. But if it's going to be a true middle school, then I think one can do that. And so again, the problem we have is talking to le legislators and administrators who, you know, it really is such a, and I, I struggle with this all the time, but how do you, you know, the, um, school system after school, and so many, you know, just, this is what we're supposed to be doing, and they do it for economic reasons, or they do it for busing reasons, or something else, and so it gets, um, um, anyway, I'm not kidding, but, but uh, it really is uh, the, the uh, full day kindergarten child care issue, and, and the, the, the middle school is fine, so long as it's a true middle school. Other questions? Yes? Do you have a rule of thumb about how many activities a child should be involved in? For school age children, generally three. One, uh, next one sort of social activity like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, one athletic activity. Um, and then uh, one the sort of extracurricular activity like music lessons or lessons or something. That's all children need, and only an hour or two in bus practice, and so that's really all most kids need. They don't need. Now, there are wide individual differences. Some kids have tremendous energy and can deal with a whole lot of stuff, and I see this in high school kids and college kids. I'm often amazed, I look at the resumes of some of my students. You know, they're in all everything, and they, they thrive on that, and we have to recognize that kids are different. Other kids are into all the stuff they can't deal with it. And we have to cut back and say, look, you can't, you, know, you have to choose what things you want to drop. So it, it depends partly on the child, too. Some kids can manage a lot of stuff, some kids, many fewer. So you have to know the child as well. But as a rule of thumb, three is, is what most elementary kids can deal with comfortably. Yes? Um, you're talking about that um, the like there's so much anger within the high students today and that they're taking around each other and the teachers and everything. <coughs> so, for me, like, I'm just going to try and use an example and ask a question at the same time. Like, I had an example of that working in a classroom or with some art, and, you know, the kids were either wanting to use profanity or or to decorate the, the backdrop with pot, pot leaves. And so here I am. I'm like, I don't think so. But then you keep doing it, and you're like, it, it builds up more um, chaos in the, in the area that you're in. And then finally, I just gave in and I said, well, you know, in my art, a lot of times I put things that people don't know what I'm doing. If you can make a pot leaf look like something that isn't something I can tell it's a pot leaf, then I don't care what you do. I can't control you. And I guess I gave up. And I felt bad that I gave up, but I didn't know what else to do because we had a project that had to be done. And I, and so, but, you know, the anger and the, just the try the rebellion to get, and I know some of that is normal, but it was just, how do you, I mean, it, it, I have the idea that I'm dealing with very angry children and that from the way they act. What do you do to get them to not be that way? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, you didn't cause the anger. They're coming to school with that anger. That's the problem. And, it, and one of the problems that teachers have today, of course, is, is, deal, is discipline because so many kids come in angry and resentful and so on. And, and there's not always a lot of things you can do. Sometimes you just say, this is the way, set limits and say, we, these are the things we do and these are the things we don't do in this classroom. Or these are the things we draw. These are the, you know, and outside the class you can draw whatever you want, but you're in here. This is what you draw, and um, so it's just set limits like that. And, and, and sometimes it, that doesn't work either. There's only so much you can do, and, and some kids, you know, are, are really so far out of it that, that um, um, sometimes, you know, I think sometimes we have to simply refer them. But it, 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 I hear this wherever I go. Teachers are confronted constantly with these kids who. Um, you know, are upsetting the whole class, and if you attend to them, then you can't deal with the rest of the class, and then you have to send that child out and, and just recognize that, that this particular child is, a, is, is not going to be, you're not going to be able to deal with that child. So sometimes you have to really, because um, if you, some, we all want, I think as teachers, we all want to 
save these kids. We're going to feel that we're not in, we're a good teacher. We're able to handle it. And sometimes we have to realize that no matter how good we are, we're not going to be able to handle it. And it doesn't reflect on us that we can't handle it. Because uh, there are a lot of, the schools aren't the way they were. The schools are very different places today than they were. Uh, and I think we should have been administrators would, would realize that, and, and the politicians would realize that, that they talk about math and science, and they don't realize what teachers are dealing with in the classroom, you know? That the kids are coming in very different today, and plus teachers are burdened with, with uh, you know, they have a, a character education, and drug and sex education, and, you know, multicultural education, and, and what not, you know, and then values clarification, and all of this stuff the teachers are being asked to do much more than ever before, not giving any more support for credit for being in it. All this takes time, you know, and so you don't have time to do the other things, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I, I, I always puzzled him. The administrators, the policies, they always can find money to find more work for teachers to do. But there's never any more money to pay teachers more, you know, there's <laughs> always. <laughs> I just, you know, I think it doesn't work. And so I think when they talk about it, as if the, the, we're still just math and science is the only thing teachers are doing. But there's so many other things that are put on the plate that you can't do the things, plus all the administrative stuff and all the testing. So it's, it's very tough. And I, I, we're fighting as much as uh, in all the organizations I belong to to try and get you know, heard. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, the current administration seems to be, you know, I don't, look, I, you know, I don't think about politics. I don't know. Single about I, I wouldn't dare to tell anybody how to write a policy or how to get it through Congress. I don't know why a politician should think he or she knows everything about education. You know? <laughs> and they can tell us what to do and so on. It's, 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 so anyway, it's, it's very, somehow they feel that education is very simple and it's a, education is a very complex system, very complex. And uh, um, you know, you can't, there are no simple fixes um, and uh, which we could get that message across. Yes. Do you have any research or any knowledge of, of, of real effective programs um, for the schools, like in psychology? So, are there any programs that are innovative where they're putting more psychiatry, psychiatrists, psychologists, you name it, more counselors in the schools so that we can deal with the anger? Because it's not just one in a class, yeah. it's many. Well, one of the things that uh, certainly has helped is a, a lot of some programs putting grandparents into the schools as mentors. Sometimes the mentoring is a very helpful thing because what the mentoring does is give children that important thing, which is that somebody cares about them and sees them on a one more basis. So I've found schools where mentoring is well done have done that you cut down a lot of this stuff because it's the what a lot of kids are angry about is that they, they're not known by it. Nobody cares about them. They're not important to anybody. And I think if you can't, you know, you don't need a psychologist, you don't need a psychiatrist. Sometimes, if you, have, you know, in one of the schools, they try to get, you know, professionals in the community. One of the professionals in the community mentored once or twice and then disappeared. They didn't have the time. The people who mentored the kids were the secretaries, the custodians, <laughs> the people in the, in, the, in the food service. And they did an enormous job with these kids. So I think we had, and they were the people who had less time, less money, you know. So the mentoring is, is, I think, one of the best systems we can in this in this day and age. We, and if you have a, if you, many grandparents are eager to do this if you can recruit them and so on. So if you get an organization to recruit grandparents to come into schools, that's as wonderful as the kids. So I think that's one of the best you know facilities that you have and ways to deal with that. Yes. Yes, we are, uh, because uh, the, the, the question is, are we, are we stressing children by teaching good touching and bad touching? All that we know is that about young children is that they can't make those discriminations. Uh, they can, are, are comfortable and uncomfortable. They're very difficult for young children to make. And so uh, when we teach them these things, for example, a mother uh, you know, taught this, her daughter about never going with the stranger. She bought the tape and the record and the whole thing. And after an hour working with her, she's, you know, now, do you understand? Do you understand? I understand. I understand. What's a stranger? It's a very complicated concept for you, child. So is touching, good touching. I know what is stranger? Is a, is a policeman a stranger? Is a person? You know, uh, it's it's very and, and good touching and bad touching. I remember her mother came to me, you know, trying to bathe her daughter, and she says, "You're not in control of my body." She, you know, and, uh, all these kinds of things. And a child is told, you know, you, you don't go in the backyard because the bad men will get him. Well, I, 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 and she 
He's in the backyard with the mother watching. I told you not to go in there without the, the badminton. I'll know the badminton when you see him. You'll know the badminton when you see him. I'll know the badminton. How? He'll have a bandage on his head. He'll have a bandage on his head? Yes, you said he was sick in the head. So, uh, it's funny, but it's... A, and so I think um, it's our responsibility as adults to know the signs of child abuse and to recognize them and do something. It's not the child's responsibility to, re to defend himself against child abuse. No, no, you know, no, no, child, no, no child of four or five can do that. And uh, so I, I think we, we uh, you know, I see all these problems. And you know, it, it has a, I mean, we have some of our daycare centers have no touch policies, which is crazy. You know, I, 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 you know, I see football teams they get a touchdown, all the men are hugging each other. It's okay to hug and you're an adult, but you can't give a kid a hug. I mean, it's crazy. I know I, I, I were a lot of early childhood students and I visit them in their classrooms to part of my, their internship. And I sit on the floor and usually after a while, a couple of kids will, boys usually will come and sit close to me and communicate in their body language they want to hug. And I used to be, very well, there's not that many men in early childhood and, and these kids, I, clearly, you have to read the body language and they tell you very clearly that they want to hug. And there's some kids who don't, you know. Um, but I'm reluctant to do that because I don't know what these kids are doing. It's so sad. It's so sad because these kids really need a hug. And now we get them to all this nonsense. So uh, again, it's, it's pushing it down. It's making, making children take responsibility for it, what, what should be adult responsibility. And it's again, this pushing that children are competent to do these things. And I d just uh, it really is a, ter a terrible mistake. Yes? Well, it's certainly true that, that uh, I don't know if you know that he was talking about Swiss children and uh, um, certainly uh, one of the problems we have is that many of our teenagers work more than 15 hours a week and that cuts into their schooling and, and even some schools cut back on the amount of tele uh, homework they give as a result and we know that kids work more than 15 hours a week, their, class, their work, school work goes down and you're very right, they use this money to they have the most disposable income of any, the highest disp percentage of disposable income of any age group. So they buy records, they buy all this stuff, and, and certainly it's our consumer economy that fuels this. I should say, however, that in France and in France, Switzerland, however, um, there is a mandatory curriculum, uh, and, it, and there is a universal preschool that is funded by the state uh, starting at three. Uh, but they do start academics too early, and so that they start teaching excuse me, kids three and four to read. And uh, so you find that even within Switzerland, in French Switzerland, where you start reading early in this or there, you have 30% reading problems. In German Switzerland, which is <laughs> just a city away, uh, where they begin reading at six or seven, as many of the Scandinavian countries do, they have many fewer reading problems. So there are, and there are problems in each of those countries as well. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, there are some, you know, uh, there's some very good things that they don't. I don't. It isn't materialistic as our society, but unfortunately, they're getting that ways as they get more and more of this teen culture and teen music and all this stuff. Everybody has to have the same kinds of things. So unfortunately, uh, European countries take all the bad stuff from us. <laughs> uh, so yes, I think you're right. It's still true that European children are reared in a somewhat different way. They, they don't, uh, particularly in, in respect to sexuality, we still have a um, ambivalent attitude towards sexuality. It's about all the openness and everything else. There's still this kind of Benny Hill. It's, uh, you know, it's funny, but it's, it's dirty and kind of, we have not, in other words, Europeans can accept sexuality in a very much more natural human way and, and they don't have this ambivalence about it that we still have in our society. So there's some very good things that, that, uh, are, that are different, but uh, 
Uh, I, I think we've had good educators in other countries besides, you know, certainly uh, um, Pestalozzi and Freibel uh, and, and, uh, and from Germany and so on. And we had certainly Maria Montessori, and, uh, but we've had, you know, uh, John Dewey in this country, a wonderful educator as well. So uh, I, I think it, it, um, there was a time when those people were going. But it, it, there are very, still differences between European and the United States, but unfortunately, um, many of the things that were common here are getting more and more common in Europe and in Asia. The uh, very child's been translated into Korean, into Chinese, and Japanese. So, uh, uh, yes? Um, you had spoken earlier about the first grade and, and the transition classes, and there's also a lot of talk lately about um, your child should be six by um, June 1st to go to first grade, even though the cutoff is September 15th or October or November, and so a lot of people are holding their children back if they were born in the summer, and then there are all these really large boys who are very athletic, and then my little darling daughter who <laughs> may be ready yeah. for first grade. And I was wondering if you had any, um, what the research says about um, cutoffs for first grade. Well, it, the reason very clearly, it doesn't make any difference because no matter what age you start, then the curriculum moves, it goes up or it goes down. If you make it younger, then the curriculum goes easier. They make it different, the curriculum goes up or the age. So you don't accomplish anything by the age because it's not an age issue. And so they make it an age issue but because the, the age, the, the ability differences amongst the children are not going to change. And so, you know, uh, it, 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 all the, um, most of the research now suggests that children, you know, who are held back, don't do any better than kids who are socially promoted because they, those kids catch up eventually, and so they do. Uh, and now, particularly, you know, you, you have the stigma of you failed kindergarten because you're getting retained and so on. But there are parents in certain parts of the country, for example, that retain kids because they want to be bigger, you know, and, and they also know the age effect that the, you know, the youngest child in the classroom always does more poorly than the oldest, so everybody's retaining everybody. And, uh, it, it, it's, it's a shambles. It's, it's chaotic. It's chaotic and because nobody, you know, they, uh, we won't do what we need to do, which is really to make these early grades very flexible, make kindergarten, first grade either very flexible or have multi-age grouping and so on, so that you can deal with the, with the reality of, of human growth, that children do not grow at the same rates and you have to accommodate to that. We want to try to make it that everybody should be at the same place at the same time, just so, you know, human <laughs> development doesn't work that way. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, may I pursue the subject you returned to? You spoke of it earlier when you uh, introduced the problem of first graders having a great spectrum of, of, of abilities. And that the flaw of the schools earlier for being able to have the flexibility to accommodate this, whereas today they perhaps don't. I suppose that, and I have a, perhaps a multiple question depending on your response. Um, in the best of all worlds, we could then say if you looked at students, uh, I mean first, second, kindergarten, uh, well, first and second grades, and made an, an accurate uh, determination of their scholastic academic abilities, never mind the age, but just their abilities, and group them according to their abilities, would this be a desirable thing? No. Um, the, the grouping doesn't work because children make the leap very quickly. I've been sitting with a child working with them, and all of a sudden I'll get it, you know. Or suddenly they'll, Montessori pointed out, suddenly children suddenly get the idea of reading. They suddenly explode into reading. Well, it happens very quickly, and you can't tell when that's going to happen. So even though you may assess a child today and he's here, tomorrow he may be there because kids move very quickly sometimes. They jump. And that's why the multi-age grouping or the flexible program is so much better because the, the assessment is a very transitory thing. You can assess child today and, and or sometimes in the very process of giving these things you'll see children make progress. So uh, the, the assessment assumes that kids are going to stay in the same place, but they don't. And so the, the nice thing about the flexible grouping is you can have some of the older kids working with the younger kids and kids working with kids about the same ability. Uh, but, and then when they move ahead, they move ahead. And, and, uh, uh, but I, I think assessment is, is too fragile and they're the, their movement is so rapid sometimes that it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and what you can do that within the classroom, multi-age grouping, have kids working. But as soon as they make the leap, then they can go to the other group. 
But if they're in an isolated group, then the moving from one group to the other is much more difficult. Does that follow with their social development as well, that that also can show very abrupt changes? No, the social development is much more gradual. And social development is much more gradual. How does that correlate with the academic kids at all? It can in some children, others not. Many kids are very advanced academically, but very poor socially. And other kids, they both go together, and some kids are very advanced you know, socially and not academically. So again, there are tremendous individual differences, and uh, you know, you, you just can't um, say one thing is. You know, that's why again, a flexible program which recognizes that kids are all over the place, and that's human, and that's normal, and that's the way kids are. That some kids can be more advanced than here. Some kids are going to be right into math and don't want to do anything reading. Other kids are into reading, don't want to do math, and, and other kids are all the social things. But those are kids, and, and they can all, they all get there if we simply make room for the variability, which is human and which is healthy. Well, thank you all.